I'm, I'm charged with a project that we, we call it Deck to Deck, and what it really is is a descending device outreach project uh, that focuses on the snapper group of fishery. Um, in the South Atlantic, according to the South Atlantic Council, there's uh, roughly 55 different species of snapper and grouper. Um, some of the most popular ones most people know, black grouper, gag grouper, red grouper, mutton snapper, red snapper, things like that. Um, and these are one of the only um, one of the only suite of species that suffer from something called barotrauma, which is fairly similar to the bends in a scuba diver. Um, when you bring the fish up too quickly, the gases in the fish's swim bladder will expand, and then if you want to release that fish because it's undersized or out of season, or you've caught your fill, or, or whatever the case may be, um, all too many times we think, see that fish just floating away on the surface. Um, and what a descending device does is it will actually bring that fish back down to depth and recompress it uh, to the point where it almost literally pops back to life once it gets down past a couple atmospheres and you can see it swim away again and, and really helping these fish survive. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is TomRollandPodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRollandPodcast.com, and the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram, or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. David, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Doing great. Doing great. Just got back from a trip. I uh, went to Alaska this time and um, resting up and getting getting back into the swing of things. But uh, good trip. Good trip. Um I'm excited to talk to you. You're from the Nature Conservancy, which is uh, which is a, a really good uh, conservation organization. Can you give people that may not be familiar with the Nature Conservancy kind of an overview of what the Nature Conservancy does? Absolutely. Um, so yeah, we're I'm with the Nature Conservancy as stated. We're a global organization, conservation organization. We're in 60 plus countries throughout the world. Uh, we're in every state here in the U.S. Um, and we and we are really focused on science based conservation um, for the food, lands and waters that everybody needs to survive. Uh, myself, I'm the fisheries project manager down here in Florida, uh, and I'm focused on fisheries issues uh, down here in the southeast. So the Atlantic and the Gulf Coast. Cool. And so how long has the Nature Conservancy been doing things like like what you're tasked with right now? Um, so we've been in fisheries for quite a few years globally. Um, we're, we're starting to just now get into what we call fin fish fisheries down here in the Southeast or particularly in Florida. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've done quite a bit of oyster restoration work throughout the state, um, up in Mosquito Lagoon area uh, on the West coast. We actually just finished up a big project up in Pensacola Bay. Um, and this is really our first foray into what we call fin fish or, or the fish that we like to go out and catch. Okay. Because uh, I, I was familiar with the Nature Conservancy in the Rocky Mountains, and they did a lot of work mm -hmm. with spring creeks and um, restoration of, of creeks and and um, really cool stuff. And then, then I remember, doesn't the Nature Conservancy also have uh, Palmyra or another island um, bonefish destination way out somewhere? Where is that? Do you know? Yeah. So... 
the Palmyra, I'm not exactly sure where that one is, but we have numerous um, conservation areas. In fact, so I'm based out of Boynton Beach. So like just north of me, there's an area called Blowing Rocks Preserve, which is uh, in Jupiter. A lot of people from Southeast Florida might be familiar with that. Um, we actually just gifted an island, the last remaining private island off of Key West. We just gifted it to the National uh, Wildlife Foundation or uh, Fish and Wildlife, sorry, Fish and really? Wildlife Service. What what island um, was that? It was, well, now it's called David Bukowski Key. Okay. It used to be called Ballast Key. Sure. Yeah. Ballast Key. And so how did the, mm -hmm. how long has the Nature Conservancy had that? So we had just purchased it a few years ago through, um, you know, fundraising, quite a few funds from different areas and grants, things like that. Um, and then with always the intention to turn it over as a, a conservation area to the, to the National Wildlife Foundation. Hmm. Interesting. I've been on that key and actually had uh, neat, had lunch with David Wachowski himself out there one mm -hmm. time. Uh, very cool. He was uh, yeah. he was a friend of one of my clients and uh, we went out there and had lunch. It was that's an amazing place. It's really a, really a cool, very cool Island. And, um, so, yeah. so what will happen to it now? Will the house remain there or will it to be taken yeah, down so or the, what happens? No, the house remains. In fact, we did quite a few, uh, repairs to it and some, uh, I know that we've done some repairs to the dock and stuff so that people can still access it. Um, it's, it's, I don't know what the exact designation is going to be. Um, I know it's, it's labeled for conservation, so it's not going anywhere. It's not going to be sold to private developers or anything like that. Um, the house will be left there for caretakers and for, you know, there's there, we were doing some, um, there was a small little mini lab there where we've done some coral work and things like that, but not, not a ton of really sciencey stuff there. Um, but yeah, that's all going to remain. That's going to be upkept. Um, I'm, like I said, I'm not hundred percent sure on what the designation of that one's going to be, um, as, from a conservation standpoint, but not developed is the important thing. Mm -hmm. That's really a cool place. There's very few places that have access to the tarpon migration like that, potentially on foot, mm -hmm. you know, like, I mean, the, the tarpon literally migrate right off the beach right there and you could yeah. pretty much walk out there on the right tide and get some shots at, at tarpon on, on foot, like big tarpon. And that's, that's pretty cool. Um, hard place to fish cause of the white sand, but it's, it's mm -hmm. pretty neat, pretty neat place. Um, very cool. And so now with your deal with the nature conservancy right now, you, you have a different, um, agenda with what you're, mm -hmm. with what you're working on. What, what is that? Yeah. So, um, I'm I'm charged with a project that we we call it deck to depth, and what it really is is a descending device outreach project uh, that focuses on the snapper grouper fishery um, in the South Atlantic. According to the South Atlantic Council, there's uh, roughly 55 different species of snapper and grouper. Um, some of the most popular ones most people know: black grouper, gag grouper, red grouper, mutton snapper, red snapper, things like that. Um, and these are one of the only um, one of the only suite of species that suffer from something called barotrauma which is fairly similar to the bends in a scuba diver. Um, when you bring the fish up too quickly, the gases in the fish's swim bladder will expand. And then if you want to release that fish because it's undersized or out of season, or you've caught your fill or, or whatever the case may be, um, all too many times we see that fish just floating away on the surface. Um, and what a descending device does is it will actually bring that fish back down to depth and recompress it uh, to the point where it almost literally pops back to life once it gets down past a couple atmospheres and you can see it swim away again and, and really helping these fish survive. Um, the unfortunate truth is there's still quite a few people that don't even know that these, uh, that these devices exist. Mm -hmm. There's actually a requirement in the South Atlantic. If you're in federal waters, which is more than three miles out, you're, you're supposed to have one rigged and ready on your vessel if you're fishing for snapper or grouper. Um, and unfortunately, most people don't even know that that's a, a requirement. Why do you think that, I mean, is it, is that the job of the FWC or is that something that, that, you, you know, you guys figure out, well, part of the problem here is that people don't even know that they're supposed to have this. Uh, is that part of the outreach or, or who's, who, how, how can we get the word out there more? Like when, when somebody, I mean, it, even on this or any, any law that, that comes in, whether it was circle hooks at one point that you were supposed to use only circle hooks, how, how is the best way to get anglers attention and for them to understand what the rules and regulations are? Because there's so many, I mean, mm -hmm. even people that make their living out there sometimes are like, man, I don't know if we can keep this fish or not. So we're just not going to, because 
I don't yeah. know exactly where we are. You know, there's so many different lines and regulations. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, what do you think is the best way to get anglers' attention and and to to let everybody understand what the proper regs are? Yeah, sure. So, um, and we actually just completed a survey um, asking a very similar question not too long ago, and and what we came up with is through outlets such as this, um, through doing podcasts of of respected anglers, um, respected people in the in the fishing community. That's where everybody goes to get their fishing information. You know, I, I tell the story all the time. Of, I remember when I was a kid waking up early on Saturday mornings when most other kids wanted to watch cartoons. I was watching Bill Dance and Orlando Wilson. And, you know, that's that's how I first learned how to Texas rig a worm and, mm -hmm. and all that good stuff. You know, when I was I was probably way too young to be watching those shows. But that's where anglers go to get their information from, you know, magazines from from and now magazines have given way to podcasts and TV shows and, and YouTube and things like that. Um, and, and that's really our best outlet for outreach, which is which is why we're doing this. And, and so thankful to people like you that are that are helping us with this. Yeah, of course. But I mean, it's not it's not just helping you it's helping anglers too like if you're if you're supposed to have this device mm -hmm. and you don't know you're supposed to have this device and you get popped for not having it but it was the you know when they ask you for it it's the first time you've ever heard of it right. well that's not doing the angler any service either like that's a bad day you just had a Absolutely. terrible day and you're probably not going to continue to fish or or it's not growing the sport right so i think right. that um you know for the fwc or or whatever um uh agency makes a new law i mean it is really important to to get that out there but that's kind of a a you know i mean in some cases like when they said you couldn't bring Goliath grouper up onto the boat anymore or tarpon up onto mm -hmm. the boat anymore. There was a pretty significant campaign around that. And I feel like for those laws, people kind of knew what, what was going on. Like, okay, well, mm -hmm. you can't bring these on the boat anymore, but not every law has that kind of campaign around it. Right. And, and maybe the descending device does or doesn't, I don't know. Um, I didn't know, that it was actually a requirement. I thought it was ethically a good thing to have, but I didn't know yeah. that you you were required to have it. Yeah. So, and this is where it gets really confusing, right? So beyond three miles is where the FWC jurisdiction sort of stops, at least on the Atlantic side. Mm -hmm. uh, on the Gulf side, it's out to nine miles. And that's where the federal fishery management councils pick up. Um, so on the Atlantic, it's the South Atlantic Council. On the Gulf side, it's the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. And for the most part, a lot of times regulations will be in concert with one another, meaning the South Atlantic Council and FWC will have similar size and, and um, you know, restrictions and, and limits and things like that. Um, but there's some times where they don't. This is one of those times where they don't. One of the reasons is because in most of the state, you know, say from our little area, if you're inside of three miles, a descending device isn't going to do you any good because you're not really fishing deep enough. Right. So it kind of doesn't matter, except for, you know, in that little South Florida window. Um, so it becomes more of a federal issue. Now, they have done a decent amount of outreach, but it also, they their reach is very limited. When I say they, the South Atlantic Council, um, for quite a few reasons. Number one, there's quite a few people that still don't know that there's even this jurisdictional separation, you know, once you go beyond three miles. Everybody thinks that it's FWC the whole way, mm -hmm. um, which I can certainly understand. For years, I was one of them. Um, and also the, so the South Atlantic council covers all federal waters from North Carolina, all the way down into Key West. Um, so they've obviously got a huge area to cover number one, or I guess number three at that point. Um, but again, their, their reach is very limited in that there's just not that many people that are, and it's kind of sad to say this, that are willing to listen to what it is that they have to say, you know, all too often management agencies are just viewed as the bad guys that tell us what we can't keep. Um, and so we, we don't always like listening to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you also don't like getting, you know, in trouble, getting a ticket or getting yeah, what, exactly. know, worse, having and, your and, fishing license taken or something like that. Yeah, like no, absolutely. And, and, and beyond that, beyond even, um, you know, it being a requirement, I mean, the help that it can do to the fishery, if people are using these things on a regular basis, so the number one reason, for instance, that we have a shortened red snapper season or almost no red snapper season in the South Atlantic is because of dead discards. 
So we're catching so many fish out of season and releasing them either improperly or they're just not surviving that that basically burns through our allotment right there. Mm. So for easy numbers, and I'm, I'm just throwing these, these aren't the actual quotas, but let's say that you can take, you know, a, a thousand fish out of the fishery every year and, and the fishery is still self-sustaining. It's way more than that, but I'm just using this for easy numbers. Sure. We're basically burning out those thousand fish just by releasing them improperly and they're floating away on the surface or getting eaten by a shark because they don't get a chance to get back down or whatever the case may be, um, which means that we then don't have a season. Mm. So if we can reverse that and get these fish to live again. So how would how are they coming up with that those numbers? Like, I mean, maybe that's what we were kind of discussing before mm-hmm. the podcast of... of um, the the pursuit of of the right numbers. I don't even know how you would you would even come up with with what a what a discard number would be. Like how right. how could an agency, whether it's FWC or or any other agency, how could they get an accurate number of how many fish are being released and not making it back down? So that's the fifty thousand dollar question. Um, <laughs> So what, what they do now there's, so each species has, you know, I'll use the term kind of a susceptibility index, if you will, to, to release mortality. Each, each species is, is more or less susceptible than others to release mortality. Um, red snapper tend to have one of the higher release mortalities associated with them. Mm -hmm. Um, I think at last check, it was around 25% uh, of release mortality. So for, you know, Every 10 fish that you catch and release, two and a half of them aren't going to make it. Even um, with a device or, or does, well, no, does the that's device without, play? That's just okay, that's no release. device whatsoever. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, and they don't really have a good, a good guess. We kind of think we know, but I should say we, um, but the, the agencies kind of think that they know how many people are using the sending devices. And the unfortunate truth is it's just not enough. Um, and would you know, they know that because they're asking people or because sales at, at the tackle shop or, or, or what, how would they, I mean, it's all, it's yeah. all going to be some sort of, uh, uh, right. you know, a, a guess, I guess at, at some point. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so they use a percent standard error for this stuff that again, you know, I, I'd like to tell everybody I was a history major. This is way more complicated <laughs> math than I ever dreamed about wanting to do. Um, it, it's mainly from their dockside interviews from, they have a, a mail out, um, survey that they send. They used to do phone surveys a while ago, but nobody answers their phone anymore. If mm-hmm. you don't recognize the number. Um, and that's how they grasp the number of, of how many people went fishing, how many, you know, what did you release? Did you use a descending device? So on and so forth. Um, it, as you can imagine, it's, it's not the most accurate thing in the world. Um, but the unfortunate truth is that according to the Magnuson Stevens Fishery Management Act, which is the law that governs fisheries and the way that we manage them in the country, you have to use the best science and data available, best science available. Um, and if that's all that we have, then that's what we have. Um, you know, d- despite what you and I might think when we go out there and we tell them what we see, if the actual science doesn't say something different, then, you know, unfortunately, there's not much we can do about it. Right. I mean, I don't know. Well, I, I really don't know whether they would be getting um, an overestimate or an underestimate of the number of red snappers being caught and released. Because, right. I mean, if you come up to the dock and they're like, how many did you keep? So you, you tell them that, whatever. But sometimes mm-hmm. the red snapper bite is just crazy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, somebody might say, well, I caught 100. Right? It felt like 100. It right. seemed like 100. It was probably 11 but it seemed like a hundred, right? And for, for somebody yep. that's never fished before <laughs> or, or, or whatever, they're super tired. I mean, if you catch yep. 25 red snapper, you're going to be pretty tired. Um, so maybe that seems like a hundred, um, which wouldn't be an uncommon thing for a fisherman to say, I caught a hundred. Um, yeah. So that would be a big overestimate. But on the other hand, if somebody doesn't want to tell the man what they, they caught, how many red snappers did you catch? None. We caught what's in the box right there, right? Like yep. keep it, keep it short. You don't want to, yep. you don't want to say anything. So that would be an underestimate. So I wonder if that's even kind of, I'm sure that in the science, they're probably like, well, fishermen overestimate. And then a lot of fishermen mm-hmm. don't say a word. So let's yep. take an average of what, <laughs> of what we think is going on. And then it boils down to kind of what, what, what someone thinks is happening, which doesn't seem Absolutely. like really good science. 
No, uh, it, it's not. It's not the best, but it's the best that we have. Right. Um, and and I'm sure you can attest to this too. You know, one of the other problems, and, and I've been there when you're on a really hot bottom bike, whether it's red snapper or, you know, down in our neck of the woods, mutton snapper or, or mangroves or whatever, you just want to get another bait to the bottom. Sure. I mean, you're just, you know, you're not thinking about how many you caught or released or whatever. And then you get back to the dock. And and even if you are trying to be 100% honest, you know, you're scratching your head. Yeah. Thinking, oh, maybe caught 10, maybe caught 15. I don't know. Right. But yeah. And, and, and then in other places, you know, I mean, I don't know about, I haven't had this experience in Florida, I don't think, but I'm not sure that it wouldn't happen. But certainly in Louisiana, if you go to Louisiana around the shallower rigs, there are red snapper there and they're swarming on the surface. And mm -hmm. so you could catch those there and they, they release perfectly fine. Like there's no problem. Right. You, you caught them yep. in five feet of water, you know, or they were in the top five feet of the water and they come up and you release them right. and they do perfectly fine. There's like, there's no, no issue there. So I wonder if, right. if, if people are doing that or not, I mean, it seems like the, the red snappers that we catch, we're trying to catch mutton snappers and, yeah. and we end up catching the, the red snapper. Um, so for the purposes of the nature conservancy, getting involved in this and your talk about, um, you know, that we, we basically don't have a red snapper season. So I guess to infer and correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the deal is that we want to have a red snapper season. And if we can release more fish properly, then maybe we could keep more fish or we could have a longer red snapper season. Is that kind of the idea here or where does a nature conservancy fit in into this kind of issue? Yeah. So we use red snapper as the example because that's always, you know, the, the hot button the hot button issue, but it's really any bottom fish. And, and it really boils down to exactly that is, is, you know, I, I like to tell everybody, it, it sounds great for me to say, I'd love for there to be fish for future generations, which is absolutely true. But at the end of the day, I want, <laughs> I want fish for myself. I love to fish. Yeah. I want to be able to go out there and, and keep red snapper and not just have two days to do it. Um, you know, I, I know that we're seeing some issues with red grouper as well, but you know, some people were thinking that we were having a mutton snapper issue for a little while. It seems to have gotten a little bit better. Um, but if we're doing the right thing, according to the law and, and most fishermen are conservationists at heart, we want to be able to go out there tomorrow and catch a fish and a week from now and catch a fish and so on and so forth. Um, why not do everything to really help these fish survive? And if we can cut down, as I said, the, the red snapper mortality rate is somewhere around 25%. If we could even cut that in half. And then, you know, you remember too, that not only are you cutting that mortality rate in half, so now instead of out of every 10 fish that you catch, two and a half are dying, now only one's dying, and you're keeping that other one and a half fish, not only is that one alive to catch another day, but the idea is that that's a breeder who can then produce, you know, a million more eggs uh, to then create more snapper and more snapper, just snowballs from there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's really what it comes down to. So snapper and grouper are the only two, are the suite of, of species that are what are consistently going through either overfishing or being overfished, um, which by definition is either you're taking more fish out of the stock than can sustain itself or that the fish is uh, under an optimal stock level. Um, and again, one of the main reasons is because of dead discards um, mm -hmm. in both the Gulf and the Atlantic. You see that almost in no other fishery. Yeah. You know, the descending device, we're going to talk about exactly how that works and, 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 what the idea behind that is for people that don't don't know about it or don't understand how it works. But the other thing that I think is important for for a lot of anglers is just kind of an ethical responsibility of if you're catching, you know, you're trying to catch your mutton snappers and you catch one red snapper mm -hmm. and then it doesn't release well. And then you're fishing and you catch another red snapper and it doesn't release well. And you mm -hmm. meanwhile you haven't caught the mutton snapper. You drop down again, here comes another red snapper. Yeah. Time to move. And it doesn't, yeah. I mean, like, there is a time where maybe this has been historically a great mutton snapper spot for you, but the fish, you know, a lot of times I think red snappers are more aggressive than the mutton snapper, or Absolutely. the mutton snapper is a little more shy than the, than the red snapper, and you get on this incredible red snapper bite, and it's just one after another. I mean... I think there's an ethical responsibility for for anglers that are concerned about, you know, fish stocks and conservation to 
simply move. And it's very Absolutely. frustrating for the captain because, you know, this spot produced last week or on the last charter or whatever, and now you're overrun with mutton snappers. It's mm-hmm. kind of the same thing when you when you are fishing and you're overrun with sharks and you mm-hmm. bring up a fish and you get that one, you get the first one to the boat. Then you bring up a half a fish. Then you bring up another half a fish. And it's not that the bite, you're on this amazing bite. It's happening. Yeah. But the sharks are eating them every time they're coming in. And at some point, and that point needs to be quicker and quicker and quicker to determine, um, man, we're not going to get another fish in. And especially, I mean, it's one thing if you've got some world-class anglers that are really fast on the on the reel right. and they are ripping these things in and having a really good chance of, of catching them. But if you got somebody that's never caught one, they're reeling against the drag, it's just out there for way Absolutely. too long. And it's getting sharked every time. Yep. Man, it's time to move. I mean, I think that's a. I think that that is a a big message as well that needs to be put out there. Is that? Do you have? Does the Nature Conservancy have a stance on that at all? Or or? No. Yeah. Absolutely. So so the overreaching, I guess, aura, if you will, of our deck to depth program is really best release practices. Mm-hmm. Um, so best fishing practices, you know, and, and we we are working closely with the South Atlantic Council. We're working closely with FWC, um, and we are all trying to deliver a similar message that you know the, the descending device is one huge piece of this, but there's other things that you can do as well. Um, you know, if you get a nice trophy red snapper, even a trophy mutton snapper, you know, you've got your five already. Hold it up, take a really nice picture, and get it back in the water as soon as possible. Don't leave it flopping around on the deck. Like you were saying, if you if you brought up, you know, one fish that that the tax man took, you know, and, and you got sharked up, then you bring up another fish that got sharked up and you bring up another. Let's go find another spot. You know, mm-hmm. it's just because that's all part of the release mortality is how many times these these fish are getting sharked as well. Um, you know, I had a, a friend of mine who's a captain down in the Keys actually said a long time ago that the fish don't see borders. There's no fences out in the ocean. Mm-hmm. He's absolutely right. And if, you know, you've got a spot that's producing today, it may not produce tomorrow. And, you know, the, the fish tend to move, um, go find a different area to fish. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really big one because that's where, you know, some of this, you know, is out of your, outside of your control, but that's something that is well within your control. How long do you sit there and how long do you feed right. these sharks? Because that's what you're doing. You're just feeding the sharks. And, um, you know, when, when you go out there and, you know, spot A is taken, spot B is taken, spot C is taken, spot Y, X, Z is taken, <laughs> and you finally get to a place where your people are catching a couple of fish. I get it. It's you know, tough. you want to, yeah. you, you know, I mean, they're paying you a lot of money. You want to sit there, but when they're just constantly getting eaten by sharks, it's it's time to go no matter, no matter how crowded it is out there. Um, yeah. And that's something that, that one, that one's, that one's definitely on the, the angler, the guide the the party that's out there recreational yeah. or commercial is that you know if you're getting sharked you got to go let's talk about the the descending device actually how how this thing works and who came up with it if you know or what the history is behind these descending devices um so what what do you know about the descending device how long has it been kind of an idea and when did it materialize into a real product sure so they've been around for quite a few years um it really started um, as part of the rockfish fishery out on the West Coast, California and okay. Oregon and, and that whole deal. Um, and they really turned around the fishery by by having a lot of people use them. There's numerous different styles. Um, you know, we're we're agnostic as far as the brand. There's there's commercially bought ones that you can go to Bass Pro Shops or or you know, get them online or whatever. Um some of the styles that the most popular is the sequelizer. Uh, and they have a pressure, it's actually a pressure released, um, looks just like a boga grip, you know, for all us fishermen out there, we know how to use a boga grip mm-hmm. and you can actually set it to different depths depending upon how deep you're fishing. So they have their standard one is, I think it's a 50, hundred and 150 feet, depending upon how deep you're fishing and you set it, you know, it's got a long line clip that you can clip directly to either a rod that you're fishing or a secondary rod is ideal. And then you put a couple pound sash weight, just like we would for deep dropping. You clip the the grip right onto the fish's jaw. Um, again, just like a boga grip, drop it down. And once it gets to the appropriate depth, it'll just pop right open. Um, we've got some video. If you go to our, our actually our website, there's some video there of a red grouper that was caught in 180 feet. Really cool video. 
where it's got all the symptoms of bear trauma. The mouth is so uh, flared open because of the stomach coming out. Uh, the gills are flared open. The eyes are bugged out. The stomach's swollen, all nine yards. And they drop it down on a sequelizer. And you'll actually watch um, as it's going down. You'll see the eyes go back into its head. You'll see its its mouth shrink down, back down. The stomach shrinks back down. Um, as it gets to about 100 feet or so, you can actually see the fish start to kick again. And then it gets to the bottom and it releases, or just before the bottom, it releases. And in the background, you'll see the fish swim away, perfectly mm. healthy, right back on the bottom. Um, That's awesome. There's there's what they call safety pin style ones, which almost look like an upside down hook or a safety pin that you can just stick through the fish's jaw, again, with a heavy weight, and it drags the fish down. It's, of course, got no barb on it. Um, so when it gets to the bottom, you just pick it right up and it comes right off. You, know, you can put it through the same uh, hook hole, if you will, that you caught the fish in. Um, there's, I know some party boat people, uh, like in the Gulf, for instance, you know, when they catch the vermilions and they get a few vermilions at a time, will actually take a milk crate and put some heavy weights attached to the milk crate, turn it upside down, put five or six fish in there, throw that in the water real quick, and it just pushes all the fish to the bottom and then gets to the bottom, they pull it back up with a rope and, and you know, live to swim another day. Um, yeah, again, we're, we're pretty agnostic as far as brand or style. We just, we just really wish everybody would start using them. Yeah. Um, the, the, I, I want to watch that, that video of the grouper because that sounds, that sounds really good. What I was going to ask about was like when the red snapper comes up and their scales all blow out, mm -hmm. you know, it looks like, I don't think that fish is going to make it no matter what, but yeah. there's video saying that oh, yeah. otherwise, right? Like, yeah. Do you have yeah, to be careful um, of how quickly you're you're bringing them down? Like if like a scuba no. diver, you know, you you don't want to come up too no, fast. It's, it's, it's odd. So as quick as possible, and that's that's you know um, why we say deck to deck. Get it from the deck of the boat back down to depth as quickly as possible. Like I said, take your quick photo. Everybody wants you know a nice picture again. You're gonna get that that big sow red snapper. You want to get that back down as quickly as possible. And it just drags them down quick. And it's it's really impressive when you see it. Um, a colleague of mine has actually released a snowy grouper in uh, 400 and something feet that they tagged wow. um, and lived to see another day. So was they it can, recaptured? They come up from, has it been recaptured? Oh, has that tagged snowy been recaptured? I don't remember if the tag was recaptured, but they tracked it via the tag. Oh, and it was cool. still alive. I think it was 14 days after um, when the tag finally popped. Wow, that's um, cool. And one of the other interesting things about a descending device too, we were just talking about sharks for whatever reason, sharks don't like them. Um, I know that that's always a worry is, you know, when you're dragging this fish down or the sharks, you know, the descending devices can, can run anywhere from about 15 or $20 up to $60 for the more expensive ones. And, you know, it can be an expensive piece of equipment, but, um, Sharks ignore them. There's hmm. video too of uh, a snapper, a mutton snapper actually going right past. There's a bull shark here and then a sandbar shark right below it, shooting straight past and they just completely ignore it. Um, hmm. The same colleague actually just did a study off of North Carolina where they released, I want to say it was 300 fish and not one shark predation from um, from an ascending device. But do they have, when they're doing something like that, do they have a diver in the water to watch or cameras or anything when they're, when they're doing yeah, that? Yeah. So they, all those fish that, that I was just speaking about in that study, they had tagged as well. Um, and then they also release a camera down there as well. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. when they were doing their release, they've got a camera attached to the descending device itself. Yeah. That's, that's a big, big improvement. Now you've got so many different cameras that can be attached to the line or, or, you know, yeah. right in front of the lure. I would imagine that they have good video of, of all that. Um, yeah, which is, that's compelling when you can see that and you know that that's, that's happening. That's, that's, um, that's really big. Um, yeah, the, the, um, we, we were, took one of our shows into the blue, uh, to Texas and they did, um, they did a show where they had a descending advice device. It was the sequelizer that they were using and it, it, they did it a lot in that show because they were catching, um, red snappers and they had it. Just like you said, it was it was the one that was set for a hunt or fifty, a hundred, and one hundred and fifty, mm -hmm. and uh, they were releasing their fish that way. Uh, so there'll be some some uh, TV on on that coming up here soon. But uh, uh, seemed really super easy to use, and and people have been using them. I mean, these things are not new. I remember the Delfts using these right. a long time ago, um, and and you know it was it was a it was a big thing around Key West that that's you know. That was a good way to release the fish, but um, now it's it's um, it's different because it is required, 
right? Mm-hmm. And so yeah, think, so go ahead. Sorry, again. So they can't require use um, mainly because of enforcement. I mean, how do you, you know? How would you enforce that? But it is required if you're fishing for snapper and grouper uh, in the South Atlantic and the Gulf, actually, to have a descending device on board. And so, what if the descending of device was was one of those milk crates, like like That's anything, legal. right? So you can make it your can own. Be homemade. Yeah, you can Absolutely. make a, a homemade one or have one. So there's really no yeah. excuse. Exactly. So what if somebody just had like a weight with a safety pin on it and like, this is it with a hundred feet of rope on so, it. I actually have one that's not unlike that, that a gentleman over in, uh, I think it was in Cape Coral started manufacturing them. It, it really is. I mean, it's a little bit heavier duty than a safety pin, but not by much. And then he just molded basically a pound and a half of lead on there. And it, it's, that's perfectly Perfectly legal. Perfectly legal. So and effective. If uh, and and then who would? Um, I mean, everybody knows what an FWC boat looks like when they when they approach. Who? What type of boat? Who would be approaching you to check on one of these devices? The South Atlantic um, so, Council. Who? I mean, what does that boat look like? I've never been pulled over by that boat. I don't know what. No, that, it's, it would be the Coast Guard. Oh, yeah. It's once Coast you get Guard. out, okay. out past into federal waters, it would be the Coast Guard, okay. and then at the dock. So FWC, most of the officers know about this, um, even though it's technically not a Florida state rule, it is a federal rule. Um, and so, I mean, they could check at the dock theoretically and, and you know, ask where you were fishing and did you have a device and so on and so forth. Hmm. Okay. And, um, well, that's, 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 um, that, I think it's a fantastic thing. You know, I don't think, I don't see how it could help. I mean, or I don't see how it could hurt. And I do think that, uh, to your point, I think that people would be far more um, open to learning how to use one of these devices if they thought, okay, well, this means I'm going to get a longer season. So I wonder how they would try to figure out, okay, well, if we've pulled over this many people or we've asked this many people if they have a device and if they're using it, and then we know the sales of these things are going up and we know, so that generally trends to more use of descending devices. So right. where along the line in your non-scientific uh, opinion, <laughs> I guess, uh, or non, not official opinion, uh, would that turn into, okay, well that might yield an extra day of red snapper season or, I mean, is, do you have any forecast? And I know that's a hard question because you're not, yeah. you're not in the agency and there's a lot of ways that these decisions get made. But mm-hmm. in your opinion, as someone who is managing kind of a campaign towards that, are we looking at years? Are we looking at hopefully this will happen sometime or like what, what are we? So, yeah, it's again, it's a really tough question to answer accurately. Um, you know, I, I would love to say that within the next year, two years, if the outreach is is adequate and you know everybody's using one and and you know we really um we really can change the mindset of what's going out going on out on the water. Um, as I said, like 90% of the reason that and using red snapper as the example because it's such a short season, 90% of the reason that it's so short is because of dead discards, because mm-hmm. of discard mortality. So if we could reverse that trend, if, you know, all of a sudden we're not killing, as I said before, you know, a thousand fish just by letting them go. Um, and rather, you know, we're only killing a couple hundred fish. Um, that's going to change the stock status. And again, the more breeders that you have in the population, obviously, the better that bodes for the stock overall. You know, unfortunately, red snapper are pretty slow growing fish. Um, so it, it it does take a while to go from zero to 50. Uh you know, with them more so than, than some other species. Um, but you ask anybody, really, there's plenty of fish out there and it, it's in some ways, it's almost a, a dog chasing its tail kind of a scenario that we're catching so many fish and releasing them, which is causing the stock to be hurt because we're releasing them because there's so many fish and it's, it's kind of, you know, we're in some ways we're going in a circle there until we can reverse the effects of discard mortality. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is one of the biggest ways. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think that it's, I think it's good. I think it's a good start. Obviously, I think everybody would be happy because that's the frustrating thing, especially with, I mean, we keep talking about red snapper and for people that don't fish offshore that much, um, you know, red snapper 
is a fish that is highly regulated, but you go out there and you can catch a ton of them. Like, mm-hmm. So it's like, what is going on here? Why can't we keep yeah. these? Got, and and you go out there, you catch one or two mutton snappers. You can keep those all day long, all year long. But you know, why, but we're catching. We can't get away from these other fish. So why couldn't you right. keep those? And and you know, they live deep. And I'm sure it's hard to get an accurate number of uh, of how many are actually there. But it sure mm-hmm. does seem like there's a lot there. And then if you go to a, a neighboring state. There sure does seem like there's a lot there yeah, as well. And absolutely. you go to a neighboring state of that, you know, like over to Texas or something, and then there's a lot of them there too. So it it's just kind of a frustrating thing for the angler that seems like, you know, seems like there's tons of them. And I know they're, right. they're good to eat. And this is the biggest fish I've ever caught in my life. And you're telling me I can't keep it. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. Unless you come on the right day. <laughs> That's what we're telling it's, you. It's exactly. Funny. I remember, I remember taking my wife, uh, we went fishing up in St. Augustine. You just reminded me of this story. Um, we we're fishing, doing some inshore fishing in St. Augustine and caught a couple of redfish, you know, had a, a pretty nice day. And then she caught just this one huge, you know, bull red and she fought it for about 20 minutes. And she was so excited, brought it to the boat. And, uh, we had a captain with us and he said, okay, let's get her back. And she just looked, she's like, wait, what? I have to release that? Are you kidding me? But Yeah. That's what we have to do to be able to sustain the population. That's right. So uh, I'm interested um, in, you know, a little bit off the topic of descending devices and, and, uh, and um, conservation there. How does, how does someone, um, what's your path to, to this job? How do you, how do you, uh, obviously you're a passionate angler. You, you, you know a lot about fishing. Um, What's the path to, to having a job like this? Um, Well, I, I took, a little bit more of an untraditional path. Um, so, uh, as you said, I, I'm, I'm an angler first and foremost, I was born in Port St. Lucie. Um, I've been fishing there since, you know, really before I could walk, my mom tells the story of, you know, we would go to the beach there on a Hutchinson Island and I would get washed up on shore from the waves, crawl back in, get washed again, and just, you know, couldn't, couldn't keep me out of the water. Um, and I used to run a landscape company before this, believe it or not, and did that for quite a few years. And wanted to get more involved in, in the fishery. Um, you know, I saw some things out on the water that I didn't like as an angler and wanted to get involved. So I started going to council meetings and then, um, applied for membership of the snap for the snapper group or advisory panel with the South Atlantic council and was able to get on with that. Um, and was a recreational representative from, for Florida for, um, going on my sixth year, um, with the snapper group advisory panel. And then through that was able to get this job with TNC where again, I can just, you know, I, I get to on the days where I don't go fishing, I get to talk to people like you about fishing. Yeah. So it, it, it could be a lot worse. Um, you know, if there's one subject I love to talk about, this is it. So, yeah. So when you go from being kind of a, a recreational angler and you get to go to or or you start going to all these meetings and then you get to go to some of the some of the other ones where you're you're actually a participant in these what kind of things are you learning like is it you know like obviously you know i, I mean i think a lot of anglers kind of look at something and they're like well, there's something wrong with this and all they got to do is this to fix it and then you actually get involved in the process like you did and you mm-hmm. go to these meetings what kind of things do you learn there about things that you previously thought well all you got to do is this to fix it and then you get there <laughs> i mean like did you have yeah. any did you have any kind of i'm sure you had plenty of uh of experiences like that but what what could you share with us that you know, yeah, that most anglers sure. don't so, understand. Yeah. Well, you know, as a lot of recreational anglers, for instance, you know, I was, I was convinced that all of our problems were from the commercial side. Um, that if we could just do something about commercial fishing, you know, us, us recreational guys, there's plenty of fish out there and we could handle it. Um, and it's, it's, it's not true. I guess is the easiest way to say that. So, you know, from, from a commercial standpoint, they're very highly regulated. They have very strict limits. Um, and commercial fishermen have to report everything that they catch, everything that they release. They have to actually coincide what they catch with the fish house that they sell it to. Um, oftentimes the total allotment of, of a given stock, like mahi, for instance, commercial fishermen of the total mahi stock uh, commercial fishermen comprise 10% of the stock allowance. Recreational fishermen get 90%. Wow. Um, it's not that 
egregious in every fishery. Don't get me wrong. Um, but just as, as, as an example, right. Um, and then, you know, one of the things I like to say for recreational fishermen, and I, 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 this was something that I, I knew, but not really until I really got involved was, you know, I'll talk to somebody like you, when was the last time, and, and you're not obligated at all, but you know, you go fishing all the time. When was the last time you reported what it was that you caught? The, the last time someone asked me, well, I mean, What's yeah, that? right. The, the last time someone asked me, I mean, they're, they're always the, the, the people, um, that are at the, at the boat ramp and you know, right. Hey, how was your and day? How many did you catch? And, and, you know, mm -hmm. I always participate in those, but you, you, you don't go out of your way to, to report anything unless right. you're required to. I mean, there were times exactly. where we had to do these catch, catch records for the Everglades National Park where you had to right. submit everything. But if you're not required to do that, then zero, right? Like right. you're already busy, right? It takes 12 yep. hours a day to, to be a fishing guide. What you're going to spend another 30 minutes doing a catch record unnecessarily. Yep. I don't think anybody's doing that unless it's something yep. really, really crazy, right? So you think about so and like what you were just talking about, and, and usually that's FWC, and they're just kind of checking to make sure that you are within limits. You know, they're not documenting what it is that you caught necessarily. Well, there's they're usually, I mean, there's that there's that with a with an officer, but then there right. there are these volunteers. They got a clipboard. They're at the yep. they're at so the, the ramp. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's okay. it's not like they're not carrying a. They don't look like an FWC officer. They're not carrying right. a gun. They don't have a badge. They, but they have kind of yeah. like a FWC T-shirt or something on, and they're right. they're just so, conducting a survey. Yeah, and that's exactly so. That's that's exactly it. Now myself and like I said, I've been fishing out here for longer than I care to mention. Um, <laughs> I've been stopped twice ever. Once was on a paddle board where I was just going for some lobster right off of Fort Lauderdale, and that was just FWC came up to me and said, "Hey, what do you got?" And, we had one lobster in, in the cooler on top of the paddleboard and, you know, really nice interaction. And the other time was just before I was putting my boat in the water up in Fort Pierce, um, just as a safety check, but never once reported anything officially. Um, you know, in, in, in the state of Florida alone, there's roughly 4 million licensed saltwater anglers. Obviously not everybody's out on the water every single day, but, um, you know, quite a few of us are, and most of us aren't reporting anything that we catch. So uh, it's really tough when we talk about things like, like you were asking about red snapper and how do they know it's really tough to get a gauge on that when we're not even a hundred percent sure really how many people are out there fishing every day. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a tough one. I don't, I don't know. I wouldn't even know, like if you wanted to report it, who would you report it to? I mean, I, I would think that most anglers would have no idea about that. Yeah. So there's actually apps that exist, believe it or not, that you can use. Um, there's iAngler is one of them. Uh, there's a few different ones that you can actually, my fish count was one, uh, that you can use almost as a fish log, if you will, mm. a trip log. Um, and it doesn't go anywhere necessarily. Um, the, my fish count one was sponsored by the South Atlantic council for a little while. And they actually used that a few years ago, um, when they first started opening red snapper again. And we were blown out. They had the, the season was, I think, in November at that point. This is going back maybe five or six years, maybe more. Um, and nobody could get out because the weather was just too horrible. So they actually used the data from my fish count and a few of the other apps where people would register a non-trip that they wanted to go, but they couldn't go. And because of that, they were actually able to open the season for another couple of days. Hmm. Um, so those apps do exist. Um but unfortunately, because it's voluntary and because, like you said, not many people use them, it's not reliable data from a, a fishery standpoint. Right. So um, you were talking about kind of the commercial fishing and what you learned about that. Um, what else do you learn about the process of, of making a new law or changing a, an existing law? How difficult that is when you actually get on one of these councils? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it's it's not so easy as just a flick of the wrist as, as, you know, most people would think, um, you know, there, there's a lot of science and data that goes into it and, and trying to figure out, um, economic impacts of the fishery of the people involved, not just the commercial fishermen, but certainly the recreational anglers as well. Um, you know, when you're going to shut down a fishery, that's going to impact a lot of lives, obviously. Um, and you know, what else can be done for that? You know, again, with me just being a recreational angler before I got involved, it wasn't paying attention to much. 
all that I knew was the days that they would shut down. You know, I knew that, that Snook would shut down at the end of every year and, you know, would shut down again in the summertime. I lived with that. And then when they started introducing other things, I just hear about it when it's going to happen and not the process, unfortunately. Um, but there's a lot of things that go into it. You know, some of the issues that they had, for instance, red uh, inshore um, on the West Coast with the red tides and mm-hmm. some of the algal blooms and, and how that affected things. Um, you know, if you're not really paying attention to everything that's going on, you just all of a sudden hear that you can't keep anything in shore and, you know, you get angry. Um, but you often don't understand everything that went into that and how there was, you know, the fish kill and the freeze and then the algal blooms and, and all these things that went into all this stuff. And then that starts to affect things offshore as well, because, of course, with these inshore nursery habitats, you know, that's a nursery habitat for the forage fish, for, you know, the, the pilchards and the menhaden and all this other stuff that eventually makes its way offshore for snapper and grouper to feed. Um, plus a lot of these snapper and grouper like muttons and mangroves and, and things like that will come inshore and that's their nursery habitat. So if we have an algal bloom or if we have, you know, some sort of red tide event inshore, that's going to affect populations offshore. Um, it's not going to affect it right now, but, you know, five years from now, you're all of a sudden going to see these year classes of fish where you get these, you know, big ups and downs in this stuff and, and trying to manage all that. Um, you know, and not just make decisions on a whim. Um, it gets really complex and, and really difficult. Mm-hmm. And how do you think, you know, with your with your experience now of being on both sides of of it, how do you think that the the recreational anglers or the fishing guides or people that are on the recreational side can um, be the most helpful? Obviously, using the descending device and and spreading the word on things like that. Are are there other things that that uh, anglers can do to be to be helpful to uh, and and hopefully the idea would be you know if you're being helpful then eventually you're going to have less mortality and eventually you would have a longer season. I mean that's that's kind of what we're all hoping for. Do you Absolutely. have any yeah. advice for the for the recreational anglers or the fishing guides as to now that you've been on both sides of of this this kind of thing? Would you have any advice for people? Yeah, peer pressure is where it's at. Um, good and bad, you know. Um, if if you're with you know a group of people, a group of guys, um, and you're out fishing, and, and like like we say, you know, be as respectful as you can to to the fish itself. Um, not leaving it flopping around on the deck, you know. Take your quick picture, get it back in the water, and make sure that all your friends are doing the same thing. Um, you know, I, I remember, and you probably do too. I remember when I was a kid walking. Uh, charter boat row over Fort Lauderdale and seeing sailfish put up on the boards and sharks put up on the boards and things like that. And if you didn't bring one home to put up on the pin board back then, it was like you didn't catch one. Well, now if you bring home a sailfish, you know, everybody's going to yell and scream at you, even though it's perfectly legal to do so, but nobody does it. And and a lot of that is just peer pressure. Um, and look at the sailfish fishery that we have now because of it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not saying that, that muttons need to be a catch and release fishery by any stretch. I love to eat them just as much as anybody else. Uh, or red snapper, but yeah, if we can lean on our fellow anglers uh, out there when we're on the water, that's really the biggest thing, and and that's what changes mindsets throughout fisheries all over. Um, you know, there, there's so many examples. I use the sailfish one as as the perfect one down here, um, but you can even go to largemouth bass. You know, back when Ray Scott first started BASS and started mm-hmm. catch and release fishing. You know, again. I remember when I was really little, the old metal stringer that everybody would hold up with you know yeah. twenty largemouths on there. Um, and, and now it's almost never done. I'm not saying that you can't eat a large mouth, but, uh, you know, you catch these big eight pounders in Okeechobee and you release them right away. Um, and that's just peer pressure, just anglers, anglers being good stewards, um, with other anglers. Yeah. And, uh, what about the nature conservancy? If people were interested in learning more about the nature conservancy or, or supporting the nature conservancy or, mm-hmm looking skeptically at the nature conservancy, I don't know, learning more about it. Uh, you know, if they, if they don't know what, what it is and what work the nature sure. conservancy does, how do, how do people learn more about it? Yeah, the best way. So our website is nature.org and then our, our actual fisheries website, which is where I encourage people to look for, for all this stuff. And you can see that video I was talking about the red grouper that went down is nature.org slash Florida fisheries. Um, and we really talk uh, heavily about this program, about our involvement in Florida fisheries, um, and of course the descending device work that we're trying to do. And in the future, do you have your eye on any other? Like, let's just say that this is a successful campaign. Um, it, what would be next for the Nature Conservancy? Is there is there other things that you're currently looking at, or 
or would like to get involved in? Yeah, one of one of the things um, and we mentioned earlier, where I talk about some of the gaps in data that we have. You know, it's just really difficult to ascertain who's out there fishing and, and how many fish are out there. And um, you know, it's it's really complex math that that the scientists and the, and the statisticians use to figure out stock abundance and how many fish are out there and stuff. Um, and if we can do things again as anglers to help that, um, you know, we. we we're we're pushing forward with that. We're calling it data modernization to really move some of these data gaps into into sort of the next level, so that we really get a good grasp on what's going on on the water and get more real time look at what's going on on the water. You know, oftentimes with with these surveys and other things, it can take a year, two years, three years to really get accurate data. And then you know, you're kind of the analogy that I've heard from a couple of people is: imagine driving while only looking in your rear view mirror. Yeah. You know, having having blinders on on your windshield and only looking at the rearview mirror, and, and we're trying to kind of take some of those blinders off and be able to look forward and see what the fisheries are doing, not just now but in the future, and what they can do. It's an interesting um, kind of kind of place to be because I would think a lot of anglers say, "No, not giving up any data." You know that what they don't know, or, or if if we give up the data, they just use it against us. But on the other hand. What what and this is one of the places where I'm I'm sure that your eyes are kind of opened a little bit as being on the other side of it. On the other hand, if you have zero data, then you're only able then you have to use the data that you have in front of you. So exactly, like I don't know, is it better? I mean, I don't know. That's going to be a really um, kind of an interesting place to try to you know prove that you're some sort of an advocate for the angler. And encourage them to report their their data, but on the other mm-hmm. hand, um, you know, I guess you just have to paint the picture that look, look, if you're a responsible angler, data is your friend, and you know, report it, and then maybe you get longer seasons. Versus being distrustful and being like, well, any data that you give them will be used against you, and you'll have right. zero seasons. I don't know. I mean, where do you, where, yeah, what do you think about that? No, you, you're absolutely right. It, it's, it's a tough one. And I'm not going to say that there's not going to be growing pains with it. You know, uh, the unfortunate truth is that, that, you know, it, it could go either way. It could go that all of a sudden we have so much data and, and it just blows our mind that there's way more fish out there that we, than we ever thought. And it could also be that there's so much data that all of a sudden there's more fishermen than we ever thought, or more anglers than we ever thought that are, that are using, utilizing this resource. Um, you know, I, I try to look at the glass half full as much as possible because I am an angler and I think to myself, you know, look, I'm not going to say I'm the most responsible angler every time that I'm on the water, you know, I've, I've let the odd fish flop on the deck, of course. Um, but you know, for the most part, we all try to do what's right, um, when we're on the water because we see it as a resource, um, and, and, you know, we want to keep utilizing it. Mm-hmm. So the more that we can do that, the more information we can give the management agencies to help them with the decisions and get involved. Um, you know, there's you can listen to the to the council meetings online. Um, you know, you can see what's going on with the current data that we have, um, you know, and, and what it says. And like you were saying, you know, if, if we're not giving any data, then that's the information that they have to make decisions on. It's not going to be the best, um, you know, so long term, we, we really need to work on that. Right. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting place, but, um, uh, I, I think that, you know, a, a big thing, you know, that I encourage people to do that are really interested in it and tend to, you know, not know what to do is to get involved like you did. Like you can Absolutely. go to these meetings, you can listen to these meetings, you can, uh, attend meetings, you can get involved at whatever level your schedule or interest will allow and being involved certainly, you know, is, is better than not being involved in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and then you have an idea of what, of what is actually going on and why these decisions are being made and maybe even have a voice, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And there's, there's opportunities for public, at virtually every council meeting, there's opportunities for public comment. Um, and, and believe it or not, that has changed the mindset of, of some of the policies that they've started to put in place, you know, when, when they hear enough people talking about things that are going on in their local waters. Um, so yeah, there's, there's opportunity. 
Yeah. Well, I think we saw it, uh, you know, for the first time, you know, they, the, the Goliath grouper um, opens up even on a restricted season and even for a permit. I, I thought it was a, you know, a pretty good thing that that opens at any level. Because it sure right. does seem to be very easy to just shut something down and close mm-hmm. it and forget about it. But the fact yeah. that they they continue to to look back into this and despite the cold fronts and the red tide and everything else, they continue to watch the science enough to say, well, I think that we could sustain a season. Now, right. would they be doing that? Or would that have ever happened had there not been public outcry and people weren't interested in it and people are constantly asking, man, it seems like there's a lot of Goliath groupers out here. When are we going to have a season? When are we going to have a season? And I'm sure yeah. that, that that did have something to do with with the decision to continue to look into it. But that's a that's an example of one opening. There's plenty of examples of, of things closing and never reopening, whether that's a, a, a place, you know, that you can't go to anymore, you can't fish in anymore, you can't fish mm-hmm. a certain way anymore. Um, that anglers were told that this will open, you know, we're going to do fish counts yeah. here for five years and it's been closed for 20. Like yeah. it, it never it seems like they just closed it and forgot about it. Maybe they're looking at the data. I don't know. But if they are, they're not telling anyone. It just seems like they closed it and forgot it. But the Goliath Grouper right. one, I think, is a is a real ray of hope for those type places that I don't think they are just closing it and forgetting about it. I think that they are. if it's yeah. closed, there's probably a reason for it. But public outcry. Or, you know, or public opinion, call it opinion, call it outcry, call it, call it voicing your concern, whatever yeah. you want to call it, your voice does matter as a, as an angler. And if you get involved, you can, you can have a voice and you can probably make some difference in someone's decision. No, absolutely. And, and that actually, um, so the glide situation in some ways speaks to what you were just saying about, you know, having, if you have no data, then you're going to make decisions and such. With it being closed for so long, there really wasn't any fisheries dependent data. There wasn't Amen. much in the way of data from anglers because nobody was keeping them. Right. Um, you know, you'd have a few people that were targeting some of the monsters, but it, it was kind of a nuisance fish. Um, so there wasn't much data on it. So it was really difficult to make an informed scientific decision because the data that we had was not great because we really didn't have any on them because right. nobody was keeping them. So. Um, you know, that was one of the things that, that we had actually advocated for um, with the opening was just, you know, let's let's at least get some good science out of this if, if we're going to be doing it and really see what the populations are doing and then make a decision based on that. Right. Yeah. Interesting. That's uh, that's cool. Well, um, I think that the the descending devices, in my opinion, are, are definitely um, worthy of everyone's use. Uh, that's my personal opinion because there's nothing like just watching one of those fish just float yeah, off. You know, it's it's just not yeah. good. Um, so anyway, you can learn more about it at uh, nature dot org org dot org right? slash Florida Fisheries. Okay, nature dot org slash for Florida Fisheries. And uh, mm-hmm. if you don't know what a descending device is, definitely go and learn about it if you have any plans of going offshore. And um, you know, thanks, David, for uh, for coming on and explaining that to us. And um, I wish you all the best with this new position and new campaign. And and um, let us know how we can help. Absolutely, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity. All right, thanks. All right, we'll see you next week. See you.